Leslie? Leslie? Yeah. Hey, where are you? Where are you? I'm right here. Oh. I'm right here. Uh. I was hanging out in the ice cave. <laughs> Crazy. It's very comfy in there, let me tell you. All right. Now, well, come on out here. Uh, don't look at me while I try to get okay, out. Okay, let's pan away, away <laughs> for the graceful exit of the ice cave. <laughs> 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 hey everybody, it's Leslie, I'm your school program coordinator here at the North Carolina View. Uh, we decided to give Wendy and Steve a break today. So, Team B for Life is here today, me and Nikki, um, and then all of our awesome other employees um, and CES staff may be answering questions via the internet remotely. So if you see somebody answering those, that could be one of our um, staff remotely. But thanks everybody for joining us today for our zoo adventures. Um, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 o'clock. saying there's no sound. We having problems? Somebody said there's no sound. There's no sound? Oh no. I don't know what to do about How that. How about now? <laughs> How about now? How are we doing? <laughs> Let us know if there continues to be no sound. I can't hear anything. Can't hear anything? Yeah. Oh, Again, no. some reports. I guess that's what happens when the B team comes, right? B team? Oh, somebody says they can hear fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> First Maybe. time on the camera. <laughs> Maybe we, we need to leave the A team on their, their job. Yes. Right? <laughs> <Yeah, it's, laughs> <woo, it> scare me. <laughs> so, our B team is here today. Me and Nikki. Um, and we're super excited to kind of round out this whole entire week, which we kind of made Earth Week. So Wednesday was actual Earth Day. It's been 50 years um, since Earth Day started. And we decided since it's such a big shebang, we were going to make it a whole week. So today is our last day to kind of talk about Earth Day stuff. Um, and we're going to talk about something a little bit special and close to my heart. Um, because last year I had the amazing privilege to be able to learn a lot about polar bears, learn a lot about what's going on in their lives, and then actually take a trip to Churchill, Manitoba. The Churchill, Manitoba, I said that way too weird, um, <laughs> to the polar bear capital of the world to hopefully see some polar bears in real life. So part of this whole entire um, program today is if you have any questions for me about things that I did, what I saw, or any questions about Churchill, Manitoba, the people that live there, um, or the amazing animals that you can find there, make sure you throw them in that chat so I can answer them for you. Because I'm just going to kind of say some stuff until we get some questions. So um, one of the things that really is amazing and super cool about um, working here at the zoo is all the partnerships that we can have because we can't do and help the world alone. We all are in this together. So, um, so we are, we are always thankful for all the partnerships that we have and we have so many of them. And the partnership that I got to work with a lot was Polar Bears International. And so a big shout out to Polar Bears International. Um, maybe you're watching out there. I don't know, but if after this, they are going to be having a live and you need to go to their website. They have tons of content on it um, and live streams from the tundra. So maybe you could see a polar bear um, or at least the other amazing stuff that's out there. But um, they are our biggest partnership with this kind of uh, trip that I took and ability to go learn about polar bears and their natural habitat. So does anybody know where Churchill, Manitoba is? <laughs> Take a sec. <laughs> Is it way up north, way down south, in the middle? Any thoughts? So if you're thinking, so there's quite a bit of lag on this, so if you're thinking it's in the north, you're very, you're correct. It is in the tundra, um, right oh, near the tundra. Don says Canada. Canada, great nice. job. Nice, way yeah, up Canada. So nice, it Tanya. Is Canada. It is pretty high up in Canada. It's in Manitoba, the province of uh, Manitoba. Um, and to get there from Asheboro, I had to go, I had to drive to Charlotte. Then I had to fly from Charlotte to Minneapolis. 
then from Minneapolis to Winnipeg, and then from Winnipeg to Churchill. So it was it was quite a long adventure to get there. And you can either only get there by plane or by railroad. Those are the only two ways because it's so high up there and, and it's so close um, in uh, what is it? Uh, Hudson Bay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I was about to say Baffin Bay. <laughs> Hudson Bay. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it is kind of this polar bear capital of the world. Where it is in Canada allows for the Hudson Bay to kind of the, the way that it is shaped, it kind of goes all right there towards um, Churchill. So these polar bears tend to come out on land in Churchill a lot. And the people that live there are very used to seeing polar bears around. Um, and they also have to be super safe when they are out there as well um, because of that. And that was kind of one of the biggest interesting things when I got to Churchill, Manitoba, is that because there is this ability for polar bears to be pretty much anywhere, you do have to be very careful about where you go, when you go, and who you go with. So we always had to stay very close together. So um, social distancing just would not work up there. And we also had somebody with us at all times that was watching every angle of where we were, um, called a bear guard. And so if we were in areas where it was super rocky, it's incredibly easy for polar bears to hide behind rocks um, in, in Manitoba, and well, anywhere. Um, and so we had to have these bear guards with us at all times, watching every single um, angle to make sure that we stay safe, safe as possible. And even when we went further out um, into the Arctic, we into the tundra, we um, weren't even allowed to step foot on the ground until we got to a very safe place. Um, so we spent about 48 hours never touching ground, staying in either a lodge or in the tundra, bug, tundra buggy, which the tundra buggy, hey to Frontiers North, thank you so much for the opportunity to go and do this. Um, but so it was kind of interesting and very, uh, different than anything that I've had to deal with kind of around here in, in Asheboro or in North Carolina um, with such large predators around. So one of the other cool things about the tundra is a lot of times we think of it as being this just real big ice place. It's just filled with ice. And yes, sometimes during the year it is, but when we went it was still a little bit warm. It was in October and so it looked just like pools everywhere. Little pools and ponds throughout the whole entire tundra. And it's also super beautiful. So I have some pictures um, that I'm gonna show you of kind of what the ground looks like in the tundra. We'll make sure we get a nice good angle. So these, let me know Nikki if these uh, don't show up well. Okay. But these are two Fold pictures. Fold them up a little bit. I'm gonna kinda. How about like this one? This yeah, one. that's perfect. perfect. There we go. So these two pictures are taken from really close on the tundra floor. I don't mean and perfect because we're not showing your face, but perfect because you can see them. <laughs> <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, the tundra is absolutely colorful. It has greens and yellows and oranges and reds and browns all on the floor. And it's made of a lot of really spongy material. So we have things like lichen all around there, some moss, some more lichen and moss all around it. And one of the neat things is when we did, were actually able to go and step out on the tundra, it was like stepping on a memory foam mattress. It, you really, your feet would just kind of sink. But then when you would put your hand, when you would lift your foot back up, the earth would come straight back up. Somebody wants to know how long you were in the tundra. Oh, great question. So I was, I'm gonna put these back real quick. I was in the tundra, um, I was there for 10 days. So, and not, I was in Canada for 10 days. So for some of those days, we were actually in Winnipeg um, and spent some time there um, hanging out with uh, everybody, getting to know each other. Cause I went with a crew of 20-ish other people um, from places all around the United States, um, educators from zoos, aquariums, and museums all around the United States. And so um, we spent a couple, of, we spent a day and a half there, and then the rest of the trip was in the Arctic, um, in Churchill. So we stayed at, um, we stayed at a study center up there for a while, and then we stayed on the actual tundra buddy for a couple of nights as well. 
Um, so not only was the earth kind of this spongy material, it was so neat. You were literally like bouncing everywhere. <laughs> it's what it felt like. And then even some of the people that I was on the trip with just laid down and it felt like a mattress. It was a really um, a neat experience to be able to feel that type of earth um, and how spongy it is. Now, even under that sponginess, if you were to dig a little bit further down into it, you would find permafrost. So soil that is, is um, constantly, um, I'm sorry, you raise your hand and then I forgot. Sorry. Uh, soil <laughs> that is constantly frozen or frosted, yeah. so permafrost. Well, I think it's pretty cool. Daniel Bird lived in Alaska for seven years and they understand the tundra spongy, yeah. which is kind of cool. <laughs> lichen and moths that was around there. So this is a picture of some of the rocks closer. and you can see this beautiful orange kind of lichen throughout the whole entire, it's either moss or lichen, I can't remember which, which one it was. I'm liking it. <laughs> nice joke. <laughs> Does everybody know the joke of what happens when um, Freddy Fungi and Allie Algae hung out? They took a liking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, nothing about with funny jokes. But it, it really was, I expected it to be a little bit more kind of one tone, but there really is a lot of beautiful colors in the tundra. And it was just gorgeous to be able to see some of these amazing places. Now, like I said, I was in the tundra buggy for um, days straight. And what that consisted of, here is a picture of me in the, in the tundra buggy. Now I'm by no means tall. I'm about five feet, but look how big that tundra buggy is. Can anybody guess why the tundra buggy is so big and so tall? Why would they need it to be that tall? I could physically walk underneath it. Not everybody could, but I could. There were about four of us that could. Somebody said, so it won't get stuck. That's one good thing, so it won't get stuck. A lot of times when, so one of the places that we were able to, to ride in the Thunder Buggy it goes were over actually ice and snow. old military um, roads. So we stuck to those old military roads. And the reason we wanted to do that is so that we wouldn't drive in the main part of the tundra. We would only drive in certain parts, kind of like a path in a forest. Um, our, sorry, so yeah. our friend from Alaska says protecting. Yes, protecting, very true. So if a polar bear were to come up, polar bears can get pretty tall. Mm -hmm. So um, the tundra buggy has to be even taller for protection, basically. But I did think it was pretty funny that I could literally walk without ducking under the tundra buggy. And inside the tundra buggy, it was a bunch of us kind of just like sitting around, observing everything around us. And we did have a driver and his name was Buggy Bob. Buggy Bob is the greatest. And kind of what we would do is we'd be riding and Buggy Bob, he's very good at picking out where polar bears are and he would have binoculars. So we'd be driving along and then all of a sudden, Buggy Bob would slow down and then he would stand up with his binoculars and literally the whole entire tundra buggy was just like <gasps> And then nine out of 10 times he'd be like, just a rock. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to tell polar bears in the tundra during that time of year. I know we sit there and we think, Polar bears are so perfectly adapted to that snow color-wise, but since their fur is clear, it kind of takes on whatever light is around it. So a lot of the um, actual rocks in the tundra are kind of this sandy color or this off-white color. And because of that, it looks a lot like a polar bear. So most of the time driving around was, is it a rock or is it a polar bear? And most of the time it was a rock. <laughs> So we actually spent quite a bit of time trying to find polar bears and we weren't able to see them. We saw all these other cool animals. In fact, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna get those pictures real quick. <laughs> if you wanted to come over here with me. I can. We could see some other polar bears behind us. So 
um, I'm going to show you some pictures of what we saw, and I'm going to see if anybody knows what they are, okay? So our first one is a little bit hidden. <laughs> Can anybody see what that is? We actually saw a lot of these. <laughs> Somebody said a rabbit, Beth. Great. Nice job, Beth. Great job. Yeah, that is Ooh. a rabbit hiding. We did see, we saw a decent amount of those. Is, somebody said snowshoe hair. Was that a snowshoe hair? That is a hair. Nice job, Carter. It's Arctic or snowshoe, um, I don't know exactly because they can be really hard to tell apart from that picture, basically. Um, but most of the time when we were up there, they were calling them Arctic hares. Um, this one's a little bit harder, and this is the, this is, it's a bird. Uh, this is probably the animal that I fell the most in love with when I was up in the, um, in the tundra because they're pretty goofy, um, they were everywhere, they're really neat looking because they change their feathers based on the time of year, so in the winter they're bright white and then kind of when it's a little bit warmer they turn a little bit more brown or kind of like a um, tannish color. And this one has both of the colors in it, and I'll have to tell you a little joke that we said. Um, but does anybody happen to know what type of bird this is? Apologize for my shakiness. Okay, I wonder if my friend from Alaska might know. I don't know if they have them over in Alaska. Somebody guess pigeon. Pigeon, great guess. It's, it's, it's very pigeon-like. And these are called the tundra chickens um, because um, people eat them and they're apparently very tasty um, but um, it is called the ptarmigan and that's spelled p-t-a-r-m-i-g-a-n oh debbie got ptarmigan and spelled it right too oh, nice hey, yeah. so ptarmigans i fell in love with them when i was there and all of us started joking the saying that the somebody came up with in my group came up with like we fell uh under the charm again of the tarm again <laughs> um, so we, a lot of us really enjoyed seeing the ptarmigans around there. We also were able to see um, Arctic fox dens. I didn't actually see an Arctic fox and there were tons and tons of birds around there, including bald eagles, falcons, a peregrine falcon we saw and a hawks and such. Um, but of course we all wanted to see polar bears, right? That was our go-to. None of us had been, or most of us hadn't been able to see them in their native habitat. So we were there because we were learning all about them and that was kind of our goal. Um, and it took us quite a while to be able to, to really see one. And we had given up for the day. We were driving, we had spent hours out looking around and we were driving back to go to another area. And then one of the people that was with us, Brandon, um, all of a sudden he just starts shouting, bear, bear, bear and we all rushed to the side stop and there it was our first polar bear and i may have cried i definitely cried <laughs> thankfully the person next to me was crying as well because it was just a moment i never thought that i was going to be able to see ever i have seen our beautiful creatures here at the zoo and being able to see them in the, in the wild too gave me even more appreciation for the education that we're able to provide and this connection that we're able to provide at the zoo. Um, so we were able to see that one. We also saw some later that day um, when we were trying to have a class in the Tundra Buggy and class ended. I mean, we just weren't able to have class anymore <laughs> because we were all so excited about the polar bear. Um, but I have a really cool picture of a polar bear. This was a little bit of a younger polar bear. It looks like it has some brown stuff on it. And then this picture is gonna show you just how much you can see that they can blend in with those rocks behind them. So he's, this polar bear is in kind of that darker section, but look at all those rocks up there. The rocks are a very similar color. So you could just see how hard it could be to tell from really far away if it's a rock or if it's a bear.
anybody else have any questions about kind of the stuff that we did while I was there? I haven't seen any yet. Okay. So we were able to spend um, some time not only learning about polar bears, but also meeting a ton of people that work either work around or live around Churchill. And so it was really amazing to be able to get so to learn so much about all the culture up there and learn about indigenous people that live in that area. We learned all about the Inuit or up there, uh, a lot of them were saying Inuit as well, the First Nations, and then also the Métis that all live up there. Um, and we're able to meet some of these people and learn about how they um, live on a day-to-day -day basis in a place where there are these huge predators that can be around. And one of the cool story stories that I learned about was on Halloween, they usually uh, want people to be able to have a fun trick-or-treating, going out time, but that can't happen all the time if polar bears are around. So they have to be very careful. They have to have people all around making sure that polar bears are nowhere near them so that these, um, so that everybody can have fun and go trick-or-treating. Diana wants to know, did you name the polar bear? <laughs> did we name the polar bear? Um, I didn't personally name the polar bear. We just kept being like, oh, she's beautiful, or oh, he's beautiful, and stuff like that. Um, but that, it does go to a funny story that, um, you know, sometimes you, if you, if you work around polar bears, uh, we were talking to um, a guy that works um, with helping um, trap and relocate polar bears that are coming constantly coming too close into town. Um, and he was saying that there were certain bears that would always be kind of in the same place. And one of the places that they would always be in is usually around the dumpsters because polar bears, if they're not able to find their food out in their native habitats, if they're not able to hunt those seals, a lot of that brings them in closer um, to humans and where there's food. Uh, so dumpsters are a place where polar bears, if they're really, really hungry, they can try to come in and get some substance, not enough to really keep that blubber layer where it's supposed to be, but some. So they can kind of turn into scavengers. And so he was talking about a polar bear, and every single time that they would relocate it, they'd be like, oh, there's the dumpster bear. <laughs> it's the dumpster <laughs> bear. Uh, so they knew who that polar bear was every single time they had to relocate it. But they just kept going further and further out to relocate them, and thankfully after a certain amount of time, it didn't come back. Um, so I didn't personally name any of them. If I did, it probably would have just been like adorable cutie face. And I'm, I'm not very. <laughs> My rabbit's name is Bun Bun. So <laughs> Somebody said you should have named it Petunia the polar bear. Oh, Petunia, oh, that, awesome. that'll be good to that's know. That's cute. Uh, Her uh, next trip. I can for either who I wish. <laughs> um, or when I look back at my pictures, maybe I'll name one of those. So, but being able to do this was such an amazing opportunity as an educator um, to step into that kind of researcher role in a sense where we learned a lot from researchers when we were up there and being able to bring back that information from people who spend time out there learning about these animals so that we can help take care of them was something that is a once in a lifetime um, opportunity and I just had so much fun learning about polar bears, meeting other people who cared about um, polar bears and their, and protecting them and their habitats and keeping this earth and helping the earth um, and also people that actually live in that area. Yeah. Sorry. Somebody asked, are any of them tagged for tracking? Um, they do tag them for tracking, yes. So some of them have collars um, so that they're able to, um, they're able to, to track them. So funny story. Uh, <laughs> Shan, what's wants you to know that you're amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the, that is, there's a funny story. So um, usually we can only put collars on females. Um, and does anybody know why we, it's not that we can't put collars on males, it's just that it doesn't usually work out. So does anybody want to guess why a male polar bear is not very good at keeping a collar on his neck? Anybody know? It has to do with his, his the way that he's built. Those are females over there. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have mostly females. Yeah, <laughs> those are, that's a female. Can we get this? Males fight? So males do, um, they fight with each other if they need to, uh, but that's not actually the reason that they, because a, a female can protect herself if she really needs to as well. 
too big. So we're getting closer. So um, the way that a male polar bear's neck and head is His made, head is smaller. His head is pretty much the same size as his neck. So if they put the collar on it, it just falls right off. <laughs> <laughs> so usually with radio collars, they have to be on females. And that also helps us because the females are the ones that um, have cubs that hang around them and males are more solitary. Um, females are solitary too, but they can have cubs up for a couple of years. So, so we can get more animals at once if we have the, the females collar. And then also kind of see what their population is like. Um, so the reason I wanted to kind of talk to everybody about this on Earth Day is because one, those partnerships, we love being able to work with people and all work together, but we hope that you've been able to spend this week maybe thinking of some things that you can do to help the environment. Um, and one big one with polar bears is talking about the, uh, the, the changing climate. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can help kind of reduce your carbon dioxide output just by being at home. Now, when we are able to kind of go back to our kind of more regular lives of being closer and around, there's a ton of like really cool community level stuff as well. But for the time being, while you're at home, there are a couple of things that you can do to kind of help um, the earth. One of those things would be, you can regrow some of your plants or regrow some of your, um, your food if you have lettuce. Just go ahead and chop it all the way down. Lettuce and onions, potatoes, tomatoes, um, pineapples, though it takes years for pineapples. <laughs> you can put them in some water to get them to regrow a little bit. And avocados. Then pot them. Avocados, yes, yeah. avocados. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can put them in water, and then as they start to grow, you can repot them. And then you can use some of that food again um, if necessary. Now, you do have to be patient, but one thing that we have right now is a lot of time. So. <laughs> So you can use that. Or creating a garden in your front yard. Um, another, uh, Some other things you can do is take an, an audit, an energy audit of your house. There's lots of websites that have energy audits on them that you can go around and check your light bulbs, how your filter's working, how your um, AC unit is, 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 if it's being productive or not. And then um, also looking at things that are taking more energy when you don't need them, like keeping your cell phone plugged in all night. And it doesn't need to be plugged in once it's all the way charged. Um, and just kind of these little things. You don't have to do everything um, because everything's hard. So you figure out things that work best in your life and work best for you. And then just try to change those a little bit. Um, another thing that you can do is eat more meatless meals. Uh, so uh, one big thing is Meatless Mondays. That's kind of a big hashtag around there. Um, but there's a lot of really great food out there that's kind of a meat substitute or vegetables if you cook them right. Mm, perfect. Uh, I like a good roasted vegetable. <laughs> and, and then the last thing is just talking about it. So we have a lot of time kind of with each other in our homes is talking about things maybe that you can do or even just talking about how amazing polar bears are and how you want to protect their environment and our mother earth. Um, so if anybody, if nobody else has any questions, I wanted to thank everybody so much for hanging out with me while I got to talk about something that um, my all of my coworkers joke with me about because I'll be like, well, when I was in Canada, <laughs> and they're all like, when you were in Canada, Leslie. So thank you for listening to um, some of the amazing stories that I had from my time in the tundra to learn and help protect um, polar bears habitat in the tundra. Um, we hope that you all had a wonderful Earth Day week um, with us. Also a big shout out to all of our volunteers because we miss you so much and this is Volunteer Appreciation Week. We appreciate you all the time, but even more right now, we miss you all so much. Um, and from here at the North Carolina Zoo, make sure you get out there. Well, you know, stay inside, but make sure you <laughs> Learn how to make a difference for wildlife, everybody, and have a great day. Stay safe. Bye.